Hey everyone, what's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the 12-game uh, main slate we have <clears throat> here on Friday, August 25. Uh, big slate and a lot of pitching. Like, we can do a lot of really interesting stuff here today. Um, it is a strider day. So he is going to garner a lot of the ownership naturally, um, but only 35% here. There's a ton of, you know, green, yellowish type of numbers up here in the upper range, and you can really, uh, you can pivot to a lot of stuff here. Um, in my cursory look through the slate this morning, there are several of these guys. Um that you could make a, a very reasonable argument for. Uh, some guys certainly that we're probably just going to want to X. Um, and, you know, a couple guys that have some difficult spots, whatever. Like, notably, Lance Lynn, 9,400 in Boston tonight. It's just like, he's a e pretty easy X, I think. Um, but most everybody else, like, you could make a pretty good argument for these guys. So, um Interesting pitching slate for sure. Huge slate, 12 games, and um, you know we can. You know there's a pretty, a few popular teams, right? Um, that naturally the Dodgers in Boston kind of leading the way in ownership here. The White Sox, right, getting Oakland, and a fishy sort of pitching um, matchup there with an opener and um, Sean Newcomb likely to come in. So. Those guys going to garner some ownership here, and you probably want to get to some of those offenses. So, uh, interesting constructions could be to just focus on three, four teams or whatever here tonight. Um, five teams, maybe, and then mix in a ton of different pitching. I think it's very viable to consider. So, housekeeping, um, we do have projections and ownership loaded to the site and to Saversim already. Uh, so keep an eye out for all of that as usual, and let's just get into the games here and try and and breeze through some stuff, try and find some value. So start with the Cardinals into Phillies. Michael is going for St. Louis, 6300 for him. Now the price tag could put him in play in some scenarios. I think in a full 12 game slate, that's probably not one of those. I rarely play Michael anymore. I don't think he's very good. Um, from a fundamental perspective, like he's kind of a finesse pitcher, but he is more um, a, a pretty gulpy pitcher without a lot of upside anymore. And if you just kind of troll through all of his results this season, he'll pop every now and then uh, for a really good outing. But for the most part anymore, um, you know, he's a 10, 12 point D, uh, DFS point uh, type of pitcher anymore and on 12 game slates it's just really hard to get there he pitches to 85 percent contact this is the highest number on the day for any starting pitcher going and we've got 24 starting pitchers um, so that's pretty difficult to stomach I think certainly with Philly because their main weakness is obviously strikeouts right you've got Schwarber even Harper striking out um up at the top of the lineup. So to get through those guys, you've got to be able to throw it past them. And Michaelis just can't do that, right? So I think getting to some Philly here is reasonable. Michaelis still does suppress production well enough, uh, despite the very high contact rate, that um, it's kind of frustrating to stack against him sometimes. I stack against him all the time, and I want to smash my head in the wall. Uh, because he just doesn't, despite giving up a 285 XBA, which is a monster figure, just has, just doesn't give up a lot of power or pure production anymore. Um, you know, he's he's good to get tagged for three runs or so, pretty much every start, two to three here. Um, and pitching to so much contact, if he's bad with this with this two seamer and and totally off with the four seamer, like he can float it. And, you know, that two to three runs could turn into five or six pretty easily. But it's not all that regular. He's still serviceable. Uh, the aggregate sample here in 150 innings this season, like, he's a horse. He's still throwing a lot. And he just hasn't gotten taken apart all that much. Um, so it it's kind of difficult to get super excited about stacking Philly. They're just 
kind of a poor offense, right? 101 WRC plus against righties this year, 23% K rate, 260 average. It's fine. Buck 65 ISO, it's fine. Slightly above average here. Hard contact right around average as well. So, um, you know, they're still leading off Kyle Schwarber, who hits 180 and strikes out a 30% clip or whatever. Uh, walks a lot, but unfortunately, we don't have somebody getting on base enough up at the top of the lineup with contact. Schwarber just strikes out too much, so they're they're playing from behind a lot of the time. It makes Philly stacks difficult to get to, and it prevents them from creating a lot of runs super regularly. Naturally, Trey Turner's had a really down season. Bryce Harper was hurt half of the year, right? Um, right, they they lost Reese Hoskins in spring training, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So disappointing season for the Phillies for sure, but. Um, you know, in DFS here today, Bryce Harper at 5,900. Not super thrilled about going after this, to be honest. He's 59. Rather play some other pure first baseman. He doesn't have his outfield eligibility anymore. Kyle Schwarber's okay here at 5,500. Price adjusted. I think that's fine. Trey Turner did kind of jump at me a little bit at 53. He's been a little bit better recently, um, you know, despite having a pretty poor season overall. Bryson Stott from the left side of the plate, I think is probably going to be my favorite here for the Phillies at 4,300. He doesn't strike out at all. Makes a lot of pretty solid contact. Pretty good numbers against right-handers. I think that's fine. Brandon Marsh hasn't gotten near as much playing time recently, uh, but he, compared to earlier in the season, for example, but he's still got a pretty respective, uh, respectable aggregate sample against righties, etc., etc. DTR down at 5,100 as a catcher piece in the seven hole. That's kind of tough to stomach, you know? So not overly thrilling to be paying 49 for Castellanos, for example, for all of these Phillies. They're kind of expensive in what's, you know, a fine contact matchup. Um, but they might struggle a little bit to realize a lot of pure upside here. So, um, I'm fine playing Phillies, no problem here, but really just kind of a middling stack for me. No Michael is for me, but just because I rarely play him. Uh, Chris Sanchez on the mound for Philadelphia, 7,700. I think he's probably too expensive. He's definitely too expensive here uh, for me. However, the plate discipline numbers are overall pretty damn good. He's got a 30% CSW here, despite just a 9.5% swinging, uh, swinging strike rate. Really strong chase at over 30%. Excellent strike one, one of the higher numbers on the day here. Very efficient, doesn't walk people. Super clean early in the count, super clean late in the count. Barrel rate's fine here at 9%. Overall, the number's pretty damn good. Unfortunately for Chris Sanchez, he just mains a two-seamer. Doesn't have any other fastball to keep him um, you know, in play with right-handers, or against right-handers, I should say. And that's why we see a, a full 200 ISO nearly materialized, 21% strikeout rate to the right-handers. Does induce a lot of ground balls, has a full 10 and even near, nearly 11 mile an hour velo delta on the changeup to the sinker, which is really, really strong. It does induce a little bit of swing and miss, um, you know, despite a very low swinging strike rate. It, swing and miss, I, I say, just in raw uh, K rate. So he's average. He's okay. The ground balls could keep him in play in some instances, but not in this particular matchup. Against lefties this season, still 38% hard contact nearly for the Cardinals. Buck 65 ISO, also not super impressive. 23% K rate, not super impressive. But they do create a little bit more than, um, you know, than the Phillies over here, for example, split adjusted. So... If I got to choose, it's the Cardinals, right? They've just got historically much better hitters. I think they're uh, they're split adjusted at least, right, with Goldschmidt and Arenado against left-handers. Tyler O'Neill still very cheap, 3,500. Wilson Contreras, excellent numbers against lefties this season. I think they're just much easier to stack price adjusted and split adjusted here today than the Phillies. So I'd prefer to side with the Cardinals go after a higher price tag on Chris Sanchez. Don't think he, he really warrants this necessarily in this matchup. Um, so I'd prefer them. If you want to mix in a Tommy Edmond, he's fine at 45, whatever. He'll lead off, and he's a switch hitter. He's not very good from the left side. Um, you know, he will be leading off because he's getting ABs from the right side of the plate. That's how they normally use him. You can mix in any of the guys down at the bottom of the lineup. Jordan Walker, not my favorite here. Batted ball-wise, because Sanchez inducing so many ground balls. Walker is a ground ball hitter. 
So don't really want to go after that necessarily, but he's fine. 3,300 outfield cheap piece to mix it in stack. So um, I like offense here a little bit and markets kind of agreeing, betting markets at least kind of agreeing here. No pitching. And I really do kind of like the Cardinals, probably a pop for us, you know, top five, seven stack or something like that for, for us here tonight. Okay, let's move on to Colorado and Baltimore. Kyle Freeland, uh, no chance. 5,400, absolutely not. 310 batting average allowed, 380 Woba, 230 ISO to the right-handers. Uh, just way too many base runners. 42% hard contact with a fly ball lean at 090 ground balls per fly ball. Just no chance. Now, he can survive a lot of the time, right, because he's got five pitches. He goes out there and he battles a lot. He's efficient early. He doesn't walk people, and he doesn't, you know, despite not being able to throw it past anybody, he's got an 85% contact rate himself. Um, he doesn't beat himself, right? It's just that he doesn't have the arsenal. He doesn't have the pure skill set to really uh, kind of blow us away, right? He can compete, and he's good enough to pitch at this level, but really not good enough to excel necessarily. So uh, 15% strikeout rate. We want to go after this. Absolutely. Even if he's outside of Coors in a, you know, what's any more kind of a hitter's ballpark or a pitcher's ballpark rather. Um, the numbers are just too bad. So I probably prefer some short stacks, but I'd like really like getting to full stacks here at Baltimore as well. No problems. I actually do very much like Adley Rutschman here tonight. Uh, 5,400s, he got pretty damn good numbers, batted ball-wise against left-handers this season, despite his, whatever, 16, 18% walk rate or whatever it is. Um, he's almost my favorite, because he's got a 400 Woba against lefties this year. And all of these guys at the top of the lineup, Rutch, Mount Castle, Santander, uh, Austin Hayes, they make 38% hard contact against lefties or more. Um, so that's, they're really going to be able to excel against Kyle Freeland. He just gives up way too much production to the right side. So if you want to mix in a Jordan Westberg, he's got really good numbers against lefties in a short sample as well. Georgie Mateo has dual eligibility in the outfield now. Um, also respectable, 3,100 down at the bottom. Shortstop kind of weak today. So if you want to, at least on the, the lower end of the pricing spectrum, you want to mix in a Georgie Mateo. I think that's fine. James McCann, historically, excellent numbers against lefties. He's 2,500. If you pivot off of a Rutch, for example, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You can even play some Gunner because if you're expecting full five stacks to work uh, for Baltimore, you're probably going to want to have some Gunner exposure because the Rockies bullpen, I think they've got two lefties in there. They've been using Ty Block, though, as more of a traditional starter. So could just be... Uh, one lefty, maybe two, out there in the bullpen. So Gunner, very likely, if full five stacks work, to get two and possibly even three full at-bats against right-handers coming out of the bullpen. So uh, he's fine to mix in in stacks as well. He's not a first one in. Uh, it's definitely the right-handers here. but um, And he may even be down in like the seven hole or something. Same with Cedric. Fine to get some exposure if you play a lot of Baltimore there. Uh, but no Kyle Freeland whatsoever for me. Cole Irvin is going for the Orioles. 5,000, he's going to pop really, really hard. His ownership is actually kind of steaming here in the early going here this morning. Um, it's the price tag, man, and we want to go after the Rockies with left-handers. We've been doing this mostly all season. Their numbers against lefties are absolutely atrocious. 66 WRC+, plus, despite playing a lot of these games at Coors Field. This is park-adjusted. Um yeah, it, it just absolutely horrific numbers. 27% K rate, 230 batting average, sub 150 ISO, some hard contact and some line drives. Most of that's coming from like Zeke Tovar, uh, for example. So they're, they're, they've just been absolutely terrible against left-handed pitching. And you can play Cole Irvin, even though he's not a very high upside arm himself. He's also efficient with some good chase, just 9.5% swinging strikes as well. 20% K rate, but he's also not going to beat himself, right? Um, he'll keep it down in the strike zone, mostly to lefties. He'll lift it a little bit against the right side. We've got a short sample here on him for the most part in just 18 appearances and, and 10 full starts for him. For Baltimore, they were kind of screwing around earlier in the season. They sent him down, brought him back up, mixed him into the bullpen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So kind of a, a weird and goofy, noisy sample for him uh, here in the sheet, but 
Uh, for the most part, he's also a kind of a traditional split sort of guy, more attackable with right-handers. Now, the Rockies over here, if you don't get to 20% Cole Irvin or whatever at 5,000, um, you're, you're probably going to want to do this, but uh, you could take some leverage pieces or some you know hedge pieces even on the other side with some Rockies. Z Tovar did back down to 4,300. I really like this. Jury Profar has actually got pretty respectable numbers from the right side of the plate this season against lefties. 3,500, he'll likely be in the two. Um, that's fine, too. Brandon Rogers still underpriced at 3,100. Nice second base piece there today. 39 for Elias Diaz. Not excellent, but it's okay in stacks if you want to get there. Ellerix Montero's problem is strikeouts. Cole Irvin not necessarily going to blow it past him. Um, Brenton Doyle really been struggling recently. Fine filler piece in full stacks if you get there. Probably not recommended, but he's fine. Alan Treo uh, also will likely be in there from the right side, you know, second, third base or whatever, if you need a multi-position uh, sort of flexible piece. Some of these Rockies here, price tags, uh, it keeps them in play, I think, here against Cole Irvin because his ownership is steaming and it's likely to go a little bit higher um, as people continue to build teams today. 5,000, I got to side with him because the Rockies are dreadful against left-handed pitching. Uh, but a couple of these pieces, uh, notably Zeke Tovar, Brendan Rodgers, uh, from the right side of the plate for the Rockies, are in play as well. So um, mostly Baltimore here. you got to lay 210 on, on them in a betting market, so that's not great. Um, but I think it's pretty warranted here. Kyle Freeland not in a very good spot here tonight. Okay, Kyle Hendricks going for the Cubs in Pittsburgh tonight against Mitch Keller. Hendricks at 72. I'm just unimpressed right at the price. He's a middling price tag. At 16% strikeout rate, he's still got the good chase, still efficient, still doesn't walk anybody, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, still excellent changeup. Going to be able to neutralize a lot of left-handers for the Pirates over here. Um, but this is a full 12-game slate, and I think there's so many other pitchers I'd rather play that just have far more regular upside. Uh, I still kind of respect the Pirates against right-handed pitching. Right, 91 WRC plus. They'll strike out, yeah, sure, but they'll get on base a little bit. They've got some guys with speed and some guys with pop. Um, you know, it's not all that probable or all that regular from the Pirates over here, and I do really respect the changeup from Kyle Hendricks. It's just that it, it's going to make it hard for me to play him at uh, 7,000 because I'm worried about upside on a full 12 game slate, and I think we're going to need that with Strider and so many other pitchers. Uh, as I mentioned, that are playable, that have a just far higher upside on a more regular basis than Kyle Hendricks. So I'm going to leave him off. Doesn't mean I want to stack the Pirates, right? Um, G1 Bay is a cheap second base and outfield piece. You could lead lead him off at 3,000. That's fine. Uh, Brian Reynolds, better from the left side, of course. 5,000, not super stoked about that. Jack Sawinski, obviously the favorite most always from the right – or from the left side against right-handers, 3,600, still fine. Probably going to strike out a lot here, though. Even though Kyle Hendricks doesn't throw a pass people, still got a really damn good change. So, yeah, you could find a, a couple lefty pieces from the Pirates. I'm not super thrilled about it, personally. They're down here, like, with, with the Phillies and a bunch of other teams that we'll get to, um, where I'm just, like, not overly impressed for the most part. So, probably going to leave both sides off and just, um, off of my builds here today. Mitch Keller going for the Pirates. I like this 8,800 for him. Uh, the problem with Mitch is that he just needs more swing and miss. 9.5% swinging strike rate. His CSW is also fine. He's also efficient early in the count. Also doesn't walk people or get barreled. Has K stuff, right? So that's really attractive. It's just that he needs an off-speed pitch to be more equitable, and he needs to get more value out of the breaking arsenal, too. Um, the slider at you know full 17% distribution here is fine as a break-even pitch. It's a curveball that he's using too much and just giving up way too much to the field. Needs to develop at the change. His strengths are, well, the fact that he's got six pitches that he can work with and the fastball mix that he establishes with is fantastic. Um, it's just that he has problems without the... It, the addition or the availability of a pure off-speed pitch that can induce 
um, you know, ground ball, more ground ball and more swing and miss to the left side. He gives up power, right? 266 batting average with a 206 ISO, despite a 28% K rate there. So do I want to play the Cubs? I mean, you could find a, a lefty stack here, just kind of, um, you know, a short stack, just kind of power hunting a little bit. Mike Talkman, Ian Happ, maybe a Cody Bellinger because he's got great numbers against righties this year. But I'm not going to go out of my way to do this. Keller's excellent against the right side. Doesn't give up any power there. Still has good strikeout stuff. No hard contact allowed and ground balls. So I don't want to play Nico. I don't want to play Dansby. Even though Seiya Suzuki's been heating up recently, I really don't want to play him either. Um, Jamer, I'm not playing at 50 or 47 down in the 7 hole. Chris Morell in the 8 hole at 5,000. It's just not happening, right? So... I don't want to full stack the Cubs here. They're another team that's just well down the list for me. If I got to choose, it's a lefty stack. But it's hard to get excited about playing some of these lefties when David Ross over here kind of spews some right-handers like in, in between all the lefties. So uh, Keller's going to be able to break up stack upside for you, which really kind of takes me off of the Cubs. So this game is, for the most part, kind of a write-off for me. Um, despite some interest in Mitch Keller at this 8800 price tag, I think he has enough to pick through some of the Cubs over here. So if you land on 5-8% of Mitch Keller, I'm not going to really argue with you. I think the, pl the price tag makes it uh, playable enough. Okay, let's move on to Cleveland and Toronto. Tanner Bybee, he's another very playable piece here, 8300 at a playable price tag. 24% K rate here. His plate discipline is also excellent for the most part, for a guy that just made his debut this season. He does have a 3-0 ERA with expected pointing about a run higher and a high strand rate, which is very much likely to come down. So if we're looking for negative regression to Tanner Bybee, well, this could probably be one of the matchups against Toronto in which that could happen, right? Um, but do I want to do this? No, I mean, I really respect Tanner Bybee too. Gives up a 260 batting average to the righties, which is a little bit of a concern here. 160 ISO, little bit of a concern in this particular matchup. But 24% K rate, 26% hard contact. Really efficient. He keeps the ball uh, off of a line for the most part. Even though he's a, a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy, there's just not a lot of hard contact coming against him from right-handers. And from a an aggregate perspective, Toronto... Right, neutral ground ball to fly ball for the most part against righties, 103 WRC plus, 34% hard contact, that's about average, 160 ISO themselves. It's just that they're sticky and they make a lot of contact, it's just that the contact isn't all that great. Um, do I want to play Tanner Bybee? Well, I'm concerned about pure upside. I do think there is some value that we could squeeze out of this price at 8300 and certainly out of the ownership. Nobody ever plays pitchers against Toronto. They probably shouldn't for the most part, but I think Tanner Bybee is good enough to have a, a serviceable outing here. Um, I, I do question upside, so I'd rather just pivot it elsewhere, maybe to a Chris Bassett on the other side. We'll get to that in a sec, but uh, I think he's very much in play, um, you know, for 8 10% of your teams. On the other side, we do have Chris Bassett. He is horrible, horrible, horrible against left-handers. It was similar to Lance Lynn, who we'll get to uh, in a minute. 272 batting average, 374 Woba, 266 ISO allowed to the lefties. Has 25% strikeouts, but like the, the, the contact profile is just absolutely horrific. 2.3 homers per nine, 070 ground balls per fly ball to the lefties. He's been getting bludgeoned all year. The problem with Chris Bassett, or attacking Chris Bassett in stacks, is that he's fantastic against the right side. 201 batting average, 250 Woba, with an 093 ISO allowed. The strikeout rate is a little bit lower, but he induces buck 60 ground balls per fly ball. Like the, the contact profile is totally inverted compared to the left side here. 27% hard contact. He's just fantastic against the right side. So it makes stacks very difficult to get to against Chris Bassett. 8,000. I think this price tag has to be playable despite a very difficult strikeout matchup here against Cleveland. Um, if you wanted to try and find a little lefty stack here, uh, I think it's much more playable to go after a, uh, a platoon type of stack here with Cleveland than it was with the Cubs, for example, because they're much more likely to platoon their left-handers in good spots 
and put them in succession in the lineup than are the Cubs, right? The Cubs are going to have Nico Horner in the two hole, which makes, uh, you know, guys like Ian Happ, it depresses their upside quite a bit because Nico is unlikely to produce a hell of a lot against Mitch Keller, right? That's not really the case here for Cleveland necessarily with Stephen Kwan, Josie Ramirez, Cole Calhoun up at the top. There's three lefties right there, and they can, you know, these guys don't strike out a lot. They have good contact profiles against right-handers for sure. If you want to mix in an Oscar Gonzalez, it's fine because he's 2,200, right? Not my favorite because he's unlikely to produce, but he's 2,200. That that risk is kind of priced in for you. And then you have further left-handers, Andres Jimenez, Will Brennan, et cetera, et cetera. So it's much easier to get to a Cleveland stack, platoon stack, that is, here against Chris Bassett. So I think that's very much in play. They're actually popping pretty respectably here, mostly because they're super cheap. But this isn't all that terrible a spot for them, necessarily. So... I, I do think 8,000 for Chris Bassett is in play. If you land on 5, 10% of your teams of Chris Bassett, you're probably not going to get all that much an argument from me. Because he still has the upside to blast through even a, a difficult matchup like this at this price tag. But I think I'd probably rather side with a little bit of Cleveland here. It's hard for me to get excited about Cleveland on full slates, of course, as always. But they're very much playable here, uh, a top 5 or... You know, five of the top six are in play, even throwing in a bow nailer or something from the left side behind the plate at 2,800. That's playable as well. So um, really interesting game here. I think you could see some offense, mostly from Cleveland's perspective, to be honest. Maybe a little bit from Toronto because they're a pretty good offense and a pretty good team. But I think both arms are in play to a certain extent also. Really interesting tournament game. Okay, here is Lance Lynn, 9,400, going for the Dodgers against... Uh, Boston, now we got weather here that we're probably going to have to be aware of. Um, this looks to be the worst weather game of the night. Unfortunately, it's probably the best hitting environment in terms of ballpark and guys that we got going on the mound. Um, 9,400 for Lance Lynn, it's just a total non-starter. His numbers against lefties are awful, just the same as Chris Bassett. So no thank you. 260 ISO, 393 Woba, 306 average. He only walks 9% of lefties too, so this is mostly just contact. 35% hard, 2.5 homers per 9, 085 ground ball to fly ball, 10.5% aggregate barrel rate. Just no chance I play Lance Lynn here in Boston tonight, um, even if the weather is good. 9,400 is just way too expensive. He should be 7,400, and then you could maybe consider it. Um, so I want to get to Boston. They, If I got to choose an offense in this game, it's actually Boston in tournaments, to be honest, even though I respect the Dodgers a lot more and they're a better pure offense. Uh, I think, you know, Boston, the spot against Lance Lynn is just better. Cutter Crawford going for the Red Sox, 6,600 on the mound for him. You're, not, you're also not playing him. Um, his problem is mostly two left-handers. Also gives p a power at a 1.8 homer per nine, 214 ISO, 060 ground ball to fly ball with a 34% hard contact. The difference here with Cutter Crawford is his platoon split is... It, Certainly not nearly as attackable. He's got more swing and miss to the left side. So if I got to choose to attack somebody, it's just going to be Lance Lynn instead of Crawford. Not that I want to play him. And I got no problem playing Dodgers. It's just that they're in aggregate more expensive, right? Mookie back in Boston. Um, it At 6,500 is not easy to get to. Favorite favorite here from the left side certainly has to be Freddie Freeman or a Max Muncie, even though Max Muncie is kind of dreadful, hits 180, strikes out like Joey Gallo. Um, he's fine at 5,000. You know, he's still a good play. Price adjusted, I like David Peralta and Jason Hayward. Um, James Outman still 3,500 down there in the eight hole. Not super thrilling. Uh, it's okay in this particular matchup. You know, not bad necessarily. So I, I do like left-handers here for sure. I obviously like Mookie always. Uh, Will Smith is fine at 5,600 here, but kind of expensive. Uh, I'd rather you know go elsewhere and, and play a five-stack of Boston uh, and and go play like a Rutch if I'm going to play a inexpensive catcher or something like that. Um, it's just that Verdugo, Rafi Devers, Justin Turner getting his old team. I mean, this is kind of the the, the revenge matchup of the night. Um, 
you did a Mastaki Yoshida at 4,800. Not excellent price tag, but the matchup's really good. You know, I'd, I'd rather just play play some Boston over here. Tristan Casas I like, 4,400. It's just easier to get to them, uh, at least of the hitters that you want to play uh, for the dot. But I got no problem playing offense, uh, top to bottom over here. No pitching whatsoever for me. It's just the weather uh, that you're going to have to balance here. Okay, let's move on to the Angels and the Mets. Uh, we got some shenanigans going on in the projected arm here. I've got Patty Sandoval going. Uh, DK is kind of screwing around. They've got Tyler Anderson going for some stupid reason. Um, he threw two days ago. Uh, you know, like, so I don't know what we're doing with this. Uh, DraftKings just kind of asleep on the couch. Um, so I got Patty Sandoval going. It's likely to be his turn in the rotation, but who the hell knows what Nevin's going to do over here. Um, he's 7,200, so we're just going to go over Patty as if it is going to be him. He's 7,200, and I just got upside concerns for Patty. I, I love him because he, he induces ground balls, but you just can't throw it past anybody. He pitches to you know, too much you know, pure contact sometimes. You know, It's not an aggregate. It's just that he doesn't throw it past anybody. And he walks so many guys, right? So he has problems elevating his pitch count and running deep into games. Um, so you need a lot of stuff to go right if you're going to get there with uh, Patty Sandoval. I mean, I'd almost rather play at the same price tag uh, a Kyle Hendricks. You know what I mean? Like, I think he's just got a little bit more maneuverability, and I think his matchup is a little bit better here uh, than Patty getting the Mets. It's just, you know, because the Mets are, you know, while they're a bad offense, against left-handed pitching, still just don't strike out a lot here. 240 batting average, not good, but uh, they're still going to make contact, right? They're sticky with even Nimmo up at the top in the downside of the platoon here. You know, Frankie Lindor, Pete Alonso, Fr Frankie Alvarez are the bats you're really scared of. Jeff McNeil is a pest. 3,800. Um, you know, they, they just picked up Tim LaCastro. He might have him up at the top of the lineup, kind of pesky as well. So, eh, you know, I don't really want to go after the Mets here necessarily. I do respect Patty to be able to induce ground balls, but he's just got to throw more strikes, man, And in order for me to get excited about playing him in what I consider a down DFS matchup. Could I Sanga going for the Mets, 9,600? It's the same thing with him. He just walks too many freaking people. It's... I'd, I'd like I'm much more likely to play Kodai Senga, um, you know, because he at least has 28% Ks in the tank here. His batted ball profile allowed is, is actually pretty damn good, right? 225 XBA with a sub 300 X Woba, 120 X ISO. It's pretty fantastic. It's just a pitch count for him. And we've been talking about this all season with Kodai Senga. Now it used to be 14, 15%. He's gotten this down to 11%. His last eight, 10 starts, He's only walking about two guys per, which is, I mean, fantastic for Kodai Senga because earlier in the season he was walking four guys per. So he's far more playable now. I do like the lower ownership here. I just don't like the price tag given that he's still susceptible to throwing the slider, you know, 52 feet in the, in the, or the split to the freaking backstop. Um it's not the swing and miss. It's not necessarily the plate discipline outside of the pure walk rate. So I got no problem really getting to a little bit of Sanga here. Uh, I came in under when I did my first build here this morning, but roughly with the field. Um, so I've got no problem playing some. It's just a price tag I'm worried about. I do like going after the Angels. It, like they lost Trout again because, you know, these guys are just total clowns over here, Anaheim. Um, looks like Otani's going to continue to hit, even though he's probably going to have to have, at the very least, a bracing procedure. Uh, could be another TJ procedure for him. So he's, you know, we're not going to see him on the mound for likely a year and a half. Um, you know, yeah, you can still play him. I got no problem playing him from a, as a hitter, of course. But I don't really want to play any of these other guys because the offense is bad. And, um... You know, did, Kodai Senga is still pretty damn good despite the walk rate. So, uh, yeah, give me Senga, but no offense for the most part. Maybe a short stack, Frankie Lindor, Pete Alonso, and Frankie Alvarez for the Mets. But, like, I mean, eh, just kind of a write-off game for the most part for me outside of Senga. Uh, okay, let's move on to Oakland and the White Sox. White Sox is going to get some ownership here tonight, and they probably should. Zach Neal going for them. Um, 
or at least opening, it's likely to be Sean Newcomb coming in as the long reliever. He doesn't have a single appearance in the big leagues this season. He came over from the Braves after they DFA'd him. Um, they may have traded him. I can't remember exactly. In any case, uh, not a high upside arm for Newcomb. Um, will induce some ground balls, but from the left side, still very much attackable, still pitches to a lot of contact, uh, and really... You know, had a, a an okay run as a starter, I believe, last season um, with the Braves, but he kind of fell off the train a little bit and was giving up just way too much contact. So similar expectations here tonight. Can't really play Zach Neal, of course, because he's only going to go like an, an inning or, or whatever. And I don't want to play a low upside left-hander uh, against a, a pretty right-handed heavy White Sox team. Um, who's likely to get Tim Anderson back tonight, I believe. But Luis Robert, I'm really kind of scared of. Uh, Eloy Jimenez, maybe not so much, but he's got pretty good numbers against lefties, uh, for, at least from a, um, a batting average and on-base perspective. Uh, Yoel Moncada kind of jumped at me here at 3,200. think this is okay. Uh, his better side is the left side, but uh, it's fine at 32. Andrew Vaughn is fine at 33. Uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think you could find some White Sox pieces here. Don't really like playing Andrew Benintendi, but he's 3,400 and he's in the two hole and strike out a lot. So sure. Um, I think they'll probably be a bit too popular for my liking. I'd rather just pivot it to much higher upside offenses. Um, yeah, but I got no problem playing pieces here because they're so cheap. Tim Anderson is pretty damn good shortstop play, 3,000 here today. Dylan Cease going for the White Sox, 8,900 for him. Yeah, let's do it. Um, I'm okay. Like, I hate Dylan Cease's walk rate, too, but it's mostly against right-handers. And the athletics here tonight are going to probably platoon pretty heavily. Um, you know, we'll see. They'll have Geloff up at the, the two-hole, probably. He's got pretty damn good contact numbers, uh, despite a lot of swing and miss against right-handers. Uh, so I don't really want to play him at an, at an expensive price tag tonight. It's mostly lefties that I would like to go after Dylan Cease with if I'm doing so. 266 batting average, 334 Wobe, and a 180 ISO against the lefties. Strikeout rate is sub-23%, so that's about average here. It's just that he's really damn good outside of the walk rate against the right-handers. So um, he does give up a lot of hard contact, 39% to the righties. But he keeps it on the ground a little bit more. And he's still pretty difficult to attack with a right-hander. So I don't really want to play any righties like a Brent Rooker or a Geloff or a Jordan Diaz or anything like that. Um, they sent down Tyler Soderstrom, so it's probably going to be uh, Shea behind the plate again. Uh, I don't really want to play around with any of these guys. I also don't want to chase Shea's random two-homer day yesterday. Yeah, maybe not so random, but... Um, Two homer days or two homer days. In any case, it'd be lefties here. Ryan Nota, Seth Brown, even maybe a Tony Kemp or a Lawrence Butler or something like that. Um, I prefer to leverage short left-handed pieces, probably just singletons because Cease is still really good, 31% K rate against the right side. Geloff probably going to strike out a lot. So that kind of takes me off of a little bit of upside for Seth Brown. Same thing with Brent Rooker. So, um, Or uh, a Tony Kemp having... Brent Rooker likely hit ahead of him. So favorite here is actually got to be Ryan Noda. Unfortunately, you got to play him at sole first base. He's a fine leverage play there uh, or a one-off piece if you play a stack without a first baseman in it. I, I think that's perfectly playable here, but you just got to side with Dylan Cease. In my first build, I did come in under this 28-30% or whatever, but not all that much under uh let's see if i can get a number here i came in at 21 percent in my first build so um you know all these numbers will change of course but i've got no problem playing cease tonight it's still a pretty damn good matchup uh but keep in mind you know he can still get picked apart sometimes if he starts walking everybody he could go four and two-thirds give up five freaking runs uh because he can't throw strikes to a right-hander okay let's move on to texas and minnesota uh, Dane Dunning, I got same the same upside concerns always that I have with Dane Dunning. Um, similar to Kyle Hendricks, uh, and who else was 7,200? I forget. I lost it. Uh, Patty Sandoval, right? They, they just don't have any pure swing and miss, and it's really hard to get excited about that at middling sort of price tags, uh, on full slates. However... You know, th that said, Dane Dunning has had, what, two of his last four starts. He's popped for, 
just ridiculous figures. Um, depth has been there, right? You got San Francisco in San Francisco, struck out 12 in seven innings. Like, I don't know where that came from. Struck out 11 White Sox in seven and two-thirds uh, four starts ago. Earlier in the season, he struck out 10 Detroit Tigers when he went eight and two-thirds. His best outings this season have been against very bad teams. So, at 7,400, he is in play against a really bad team over here in the Minnesota Twins in terms of DFS because they're super attackable. 28% K rate nearly still in a 3,600 plate appearance sample. 108 WRC plus because they walk a little bit and they hit for some power, but they do not hit for a lot of average and they strike out a crap load. So, I don't want to stack against Dane Dunning here. I think it's very reasonable if you land on him at 74, going after a super high variance team in the Twins. I have no idea how they're four games over 500. If you want to go after them, he excels in in good matchups. This is undoubtedly a very good matchup. This cutter here is just a fantastic pitch against left-handers. And despite the fact that it's not his swing and miss pitch or anything like that, if he's got the slider changeup working, he can still induce a little bit of swing and miss. Um, he does still have 19% in the tank. It's just that you know most of his suppression uh, upside really just comes from the cutter, which is not the swing and miss type of stuff, right? Just 26% hard contact allowed to the lefties. And he induces ground ball. So I think he's very much in play here. Got to be careful of the pure fly ball hitters from the left side. Uh, that don't strike out a lot. Um, you know, maybe like a Max Kepler a little bit, potentially a Matt Walner, but Joey Gallo, Eddie Julian, these guys are going to strike out. They'll make contact in this particular matchup, right, with just a 16% K rate for Dunning against the lefties, but those guys still strike out at 30% or more. Um, so it's not like it's all that great a spot necessarily. I don't think it's horrible if you land on a couple Dane Dunning pieces here. And as a matter of fact, I, I, I did come in over the field. I got like 8% in my first build here this morning. So um, it, it's very reasonable to go after the Minnesota Twins here. They are absolutely horrific. A break-even offense, I, like I said, I have no clue how they won four games um, or how they're four games over 500. Sonny Gray going for the Twins at 9,000. All right. Um, I can't do this, number one. I think he's a little too expensive for this particular matchup against Texas, right? Um, against right-handers, they did 116 WRC+, plus, 22.5% K rate, 9% walk rate, it's fine, whatever. 190 ISO, though, and 37% hard with fly balls, right? Neutral ground ball to fly ball, 22% line drives. Um, I, I, you just can't go after Texas with guys that don't have just absolutely elite, elite, elite stuff. It's so difficult. Yeah, obviously, they're going to shit the bed every now and then. Somebody's going to pop against them every now and then. Um, Sonny Gray, like, I do respect him, of course, right? 27% Ks to the righties, 22% to the lefties. Doesn't give up any power whatsoever. 117 X ISO, 300 X Woba, and a 245 X BA. Really attractive here. Still induces a lot of ground balls. I love this. The problem when with Texas is the guys you're scared of, right? Semyon, Seager, Addy Garcia, Mitch Garver, the power hitters, they're fly ball hitters. So it lines up pretty well for them to get the baseball on a line here against Sonny because he's got 20% line drive rates to both sides of the plate. It's 22% in aggregate. Now, do I want to play Marcus Semien at 5,900? Well, absolutely not. Do I want to play Addy Garcia 54 or Mitch Garver at 37? No, they're going to strike out a lot. You know, so I don't really want to do this, but the battle ball profile could match up a little bit for them, which is kind of questionable at this particular 9K price tag for Sonny Gray. Six pitches, though, everything's great. Plate discipline is, is fantastic, really top to bottom. He's getting the walk rate that had elevated a little bit earlier in the season, a bit more under control now, hovering at 8, 8.5%, whatever, it's fine, doesn't get barreled. I, I love Sonny, it's just a, a price tag for him that really kind of um, limits his upside. So he's another one of these guys that is in play if you land on a couple of these teams. I am I only got, I think, 
or something when I I built this morning my first run. So, you know, I I I don't want to get more than this necessarily because I hate going after Texas. I'll probably end up just xing it and not dealing with it um, because I question the price tag. But it's in play. You know, it you wouldn't have to you know twist my arm too hard. Um, you know, to convince me that Sonny Gray is a, a, an okay play here tonight. So, for the most part, I'm off of offense. I, I loved Corey Seager always. Uh, and if you want to target Dane Dunning over here, uh, it'd probably be, I mean, sure, from a power perspective, it's with a lefty. But, like, I don't want to go after this cutter, man. I really respect his pitch. So, mostly pitching here uh, for me. Very little offense. Also, another kind of write-off. Okay, San Diego, Milwaukee, you Darvish, 8,500, very playable once again. He's been this cheap pretty much all season. 28 value score here is fine, and he gets a damn good matchup over here. Plate discipline is pretty okay. He's actually got one of the lower strike one rates of anybody going today. we got a bunch of efficient arms here tonight. 28% chase. We need. It's kind of shocking that Darvish throws so much garbage. Uh, that he only has a 28% carry. So we'd like this a little bit higher. 29% CSW, though, despite a sub-11% swing strike rate, it's buoyed by the called strike rate, pushing 18%. And that's where all the junk that he's throwing is, is really shining. If we want to go after him, it's with left-handers, 272 batting average, 342 Woba, 180 ISO, 25% K rate. So we don't want high strikeout left-handers. Um it would be Yelich, and it'd be like Rowdy Telez, uh, even a Carlos Santana. That's a fine little lefty stack. But he's pretty damn good against right-handers. So with the right-handers that are going to be strewn in the middle, similar to the Cubs um, you know, and David Ross, uh, Craig Council does this with William Contreras, Willie Adamas, Mark Kana as well in the middle of the lineup. So hard to get excited about a Brewer stack going after Darvish. So I'd rather play him. At 8,500, I think there's upside in this particular matchup. The Brewers are terrible, right, against right-handed pitching. 87 WRC+. Plus. They strike out at an average to slightly above-average clip. Hit for uh, below-average batting average. Way below-average power. Average to below-average hard contact rate. So let's do it. Um, no problems playing Darvish here either. And it's really, like, the only couple of guys I'm... I, wouldn't, I don't even want to say scared of, but it'd be like Christian Yelich, 5,300. I think he's a fine play or a Rowdy Telez at 2,200, mostly just because he's super cheap. Uh, Carlos Santana from the left side, 3,900. I'm not wild about the price tag, but he didn't strike out. He walks a lot and has shown a lot of power still. So um, those guys are playable. I don't want any of the righties. I don't want to deal with them. Um, it's certainly Willie Adamas. He's going to strike out a lot here. So not really... Uh, thrilling to be going after any uh, Brewers here and Darvish. Just give me him. And the same thing with Brandon Woodruff. I really respect him. If you can't get all the way up to Strider, who we'll go over in a little bit, at 10-4, I think Brandon Woodruff's a perfectly reasonable play. He's got, you know, 25-plus percent strikeouts to both sides of the plate, really always has. He's not overly susceptible to either side. He's got uh, two fine fastballs, which he... Um, he uses against the correct sides of the plate, as it were, two-seamer to righties, four-seamer really to both, uh, but more so to left-handers. Change-up really keeps left-handers off the board. Um, so in the platoon, he's got a lot of swing and miss there, and we see that even in the short sample for him this season. He's back up at 30%. That really isn't likely to change. And he's got good swing and miss in both the slider curveball. So he's, he's very equitable here in the distribution. Good five-pitch mix, four-seamer, two-seamer, slider curveball change. Um, so I got no problem playing him at 10-4. This is also a pretty good matchup against a pretty average to below average production team in the Padres, 99 WRC+. Plus. They're just kind of sticky sometimes because they don't strike out a lot. So that could take you off of some Woodruff at an expensive price tag. They will walk, but, you know, Woodruff doesn't have walk problems. Um, they'll hit for a little bit of pop, and that's really where most of their creation is coming from, but they hit sub-230 as a team. So you can go after this, and I got no problems playing Brandon Woodruff here tonight. You know, ownership adjusted, I'd obviously, and price tag as well, I'd much rather just play him at 10% and 2400 cheaper than Spencer Strider. So... Uh, no problems whatsoever, and I did get a good bit of him. Let's see if I can 
check on the other side or the other monitor here how much. Um, yeah, I got actually more than Strider. I got 15% um, in my in my first build. I haven't made any adjustments or anything like that. So, you know, I got no problems playing Brandon Woodruff. So pitching mostly here for me, I don't really want to deal with any offense. Certainly, I mean, pretty much nothing from the Padres. I don't want to screw around with that. And maybe a piece here or there, Rowdy Telez, Christian Yelich from the Brewers. Okay, since he's in Arizona, this is a really interesting spot here. Hunter Green got absolutely destroyed by Toronto um, in his first start back off the deal. Now, that was a bad matchup for him in particular, well, for everybody in baseball, but for him in particular because he gives up a 282 ISO, 36% hard contact with fly balls to the right side. Batting average, no walks, so it's all contact, two homers per nine to the righties. Much better against the lefties in terms of production. Does give up a little bit of pop still and, and a lot of fly balls with some hard contact. So it's not like he's not susceptible, but he has a 35% K rate against the left side. Not really because of the change. Doesn't use it a whole hell of a lot. It's just four-seamer at you know elite velocity and swing and miss with the slider. 213 batting average and a 311 Woba despite an 11.5% walk rate to the left side. So he's, from a contact perspective, elite against the lefties, which makes it very interesting here. Arizona's actually popping very hard in, I mean, kind of surprisingly hard in projection so far. I don't think that's right, to be quite honest. I think this median projection for Hunter Green is probably okay. I think the price tag is maybe a little high. I'd rather probably play him, though, than Sonny Gray at the exact same price tag. Um, the reason being, Arizona is going to platoon over here a little bit with left-handers up at the top of the lineup. Like Lourdes, he might not even be in the list tonight. Um, you know, they might screw around, throw another lefty in the outfield or something, um, and, and sit him. So they may very well have seven lefties in the lineup, and that actually plays into Hunter Green's favor. Like, you want a lot of right-handers here. Like, Tommy Pham will probably be in there. Christian Walker almost definitely um, so I am scared of Christian Walker for sure. But for the most part, I think Hunter Green is very much playable. It's super low ownership here. He has a lot of upside. And at very low ownership, even admittedly in a super difficult matchup, these guys don't strike out a lot, right? 20, 21%. Hit for a little bit of average, 250, 260, 170, a little bit of power, some hard contact. They're sticky. And with a slight ground ball lean in aggregate for them. It does match up well, batted ball-wise. All right, so let's not get that confused. That's why they're popping in the projections. But I think Hunter Green is a pretty shrewd deep tournament play here. This is not the same spot as Toronto where he just got absolutely bludgeoned. It's a totally different matchup, and I really like playing a bounce, a momentum type of bounce. He's not that bad an arm, and he's not going to give up eight earned runs or whatever every single outing. Um... He's got a lot of swing and miss, and I really like going after that. He's efficient early in the count. The walks to left-handers are a concern, sure, and the barrels to right-handers are a concern, sure. But he's got a 14% swing strike rate, 30% chase, 64% strike one, and a raw 30% strikeout rate. Like, let's do it at super low ownership. You, I think this is a pretty decent tournament play uh, at 9,000. I think he's got a little bit of upside here. You don't need to go crazy with it, but I did get 10% of Hunter Green, for example. Um, Brandon Fott, I'm getting a lot of him, too. I'm not sure about this. Seems a little fishy. I think I'd rather play Cole Irvin instead, uh, who we talked about earlier. 5,600 for him. His numbers are absolutely horrific. Like, look at this. I, I don't know how we're going to eat 25% of our teams on these types of numbers. He's got a 215x ISO. 346 X Woba and a 267 XBA. Now, he's got a 615 ERA with expected metrics pointing a run and a half lower, super low strand rate, 67, 68%. We're looking for positive regression, and Brandon Fott's not this bad. Like, he just got, you know, kind of jumped on when they brought him up probably a bit sooner than they were expecting, or a bit sooner than they wanted to. Certainly was not ready. But since they sent him down, he figured some things out. He's got more confidence now that he can not compete at this level. And his last several starts have been much better. So, sure, is he in play? Well, yeah, he's 5,600. And the Reds against right-handers, just 94 WRC plus as well. 
and 25% strikeout rate, buck 65 ISO, sub 30% hard contact, sub 250 batting average. They're attackable, definitely. But Brent Fott doesn't have a lot of strikeout stuff, and I'm really worried about him being able to throw it past people here. So, honestly, the Reds aren't getting a lot of love. I think this is kind of a mistake. I'm going to have Brandon Fott for sure, but I don't think I'm going to come in anywhere near this figure. I think it's too high. It's really just the price tag that's popping this so hard, for me at least. Um, You know, I love the value score and the projection, you know, all of this. It's great. And sure, he could pop for 15 points, but we're talking about a 12-game slate. Win tournaments, you need 25 and 30 at a minimum. 15 points ain't going to do it. So I'd probably rather play Cole Irvin. I think he's got more regular upside, and the matchup is not nearly as bad for Cole Irvin as it is here for Brandon Fodd against the Reds. He's a good offense, man. I want to try and stack some of the Reds. They're a little bit more palatable price-wise, 44 for TJ Friedel. McLean and Ellie are still expensive, of course, so is Spencer Steer, but he's fine at 5000 Nick Martini makes everything cheaper for you, at in, pr- probably in the five hole, 2200 You know, he's not a great hitter necessarily. Um, you know, but he's in the five hole at 22 in the outfield. Like, go ahead. Same thing with Will Benson down at the, you know, maybe eight hole, 3500 He's been excellent over the last, you know, two months or so, E3 at 3,400 at first base. You don't have to battle with Joey Votto now, so you can play CES. That's fine. Very much stackable here are the Reds, I think. And in deeper tournament stuff, I think they're a pretty viable stack. I've mentioned a couple of times that they're a pretty good 20 max tournament stack, um, especially if you're getting a lot of leverage off of Brandon Fott. He'll be popular in 20 max. So I think that makes the Reds very intriguing here tonight. Okay, Kansas City, Seattle. Uh, Brady Singer, 6,900. Okay, yeah, he's playable too, right? He's been far, far better recently in aggregate than he was earlier in the season when he was just getting destroyed. They were leaving him out to just eat a 10 spot every day. Um, he's been much better over his last eight start, 10 starts even. Two, four, six, 12 starts nearly. Uh, been fantastic. Really, for the most part, he's, he's throwing out two kind of stinkers, right? He got beat up by Cleveland, gave up six earned, and sprayed 13 hits. And then he got beat up a little bit by the Cubs in his last outing, gave up four earned, just went three and two-thirds, struck out just three. But the strikeout stuff is starting to come back a little bit for him. Start before his last in C, uh, against Seattle, I should say, struck out eight and seven and a third. The depth is there, six and two-thirds against Boston, eight against the Mets. Um, five against Minnesota, but he struck out 10, right? Only gave up two runs, six against the Yankees, eight innings against Tampa, et cetera, et cetera. So he's been much better recently in 6,900 at getting Seattle once again. I think it's playable. However, as is usual for me, I typically side with the offense when they are seeing a guy multiple times in a season, number one, and certainly in such quick succession. Um, they saw him two starts ago. So I would generally side with the offense, but like Seattle's offense is terrible. Like even though they've been better recently, they've had a lot of really good matchups. I'm not sure this is the best matchup. And once again, they got taken apart by him not two starts ago where, where he went seven and a third, struck out eight, only gave up two runs. He's also a thousand dollars cheaper than he was two starts ago. So I think he's very much in play once again at super low ownership. Um, you can mix him in as an SP2. I'm not overly thrilled with the aggregate strikeout stuff. Generally have some upside concerns for him, but that's a little bit priced in for us here. Um, the, and the matchup really accounts for some of that downside as well. So I think it's okay. We still have positive regression coming to Brady Singer, still at very low strand rate, 65% here. He induces a hell of a lot of ground balls. Gives up a little bit of pop to the lefty still at a buck 30 ground ball to fly ball and a 180 ISO with 40% hard contact. You know, so let's not get it confused. He's not going to blow us away here, but he's very much playable at, at a cheaper price tag. I think he's probably in the 7K range uh, my favorite if I don't get to Dunning or Patty Sandoval or Kyle Hendricks. I think Brady Singer's got more upside at the relative price tag than all of these guys. Um, so I think it's fine getting to a little singer here, uh, targeting some Seattle. It, it, it's in Seattle. This is still kind of a hitter's ballpark. Uh, excuse me, a, a, kind of a, a pitcher's ballpark. So no problems there. Bryce Miller, 
for the Mariners, well, he gets Kansas City, right? I mean, they've been attackable pretty much all season. Strikeout rate a little bit more difficult to go after now. Over the last, what, month and a half or so, they've been far, far better in that category, but they still only hit for about a 240 batting average. Stone break even relative to league average. Woba here at 300. The hard contact number has dropped off quite a bit. Uh, it used to be 35, 37% earlier in the season. 34.5% hard contact split adjusted now. Still just the 86 WRC+. Plus. Bobby Witt's been incredible recently, um, but I'm not playing him at 6,200 in this particular matchup. Bryce Miller is fantastic against right-handers. 187 batting average, 237 Woba, and a 129 ISO. It's just elite numbers. 26% strikeout rate with a 4% walk rate. It's fantastic. He does give up 34% hard and 080 ground ball to fly ball to the righties. But, like, whatever. He just doesn't give up any production. Against the lefties is where he's got a little bit of an issue. Uh, 250 batting average, not horrible. 326 Woba, not horrible. 217 ISO is starting to get attackable. 19% strikeout rate, strikeout rate, very much attackable. It's really the 060 ground ball to fly ball. 23.5% line drive rate and the 41% hard contact rate that make him super um, vulnerable to left-handers. 1.6 homers per nine here. Has a raw 11% barrel rate. So you could go after this a little bit with some left-handed pieces from the Royals, in particular Michael Massey. I really like this at 3,200. think this is fine. MJ Melendez still strikes out a lot against right-handers, but uh, he still makes a ton of hard contact, 35. And you could mix in a Drew Waters or a Matt Beatty, Kyle Isbell, down at the bottom of the lineup, if you choose to do that. I think I'd probably prefer, because he's so good against righties, we talked about this a few times on this slate, probably prefer to get to one-off pieces maybe, um, maybe a short stack of like a, a, a Michael Massey, Salvi, MJ, 3-4-5 or something. Um, not overly thrilled about playing Salvi in this spot necessarily either, uh, but I, I'm not playing Bobby Witt at 62. So it's just a short stack there, or just singleton pieces from the Royals for me going after Bryce Miller. But, once again, he's also in play because the Royals are still a really low upside offense. And if they've got six righties in the lineup, I got no problems going after that because Michael Massey's still going to strike out. You know, MJ is still going to strike out. So it's very much playable, kind of both sides here to some degree or another. Um if I had to choose 8,600, I'd probably just side with Bryce Miller. But it's close. I, I do really like Michael, Michael Massey here at 3,200. That kind of jumped off the page for me at second base here tonight. Okay, let's uh, let's move on um, to the last game of the night here at Atlanta and the Giants. Here's Strider. No problems whatsoever playing, and we could probably get through this pretty quick. He's 12,800, though. He is 35 and 40% owned. That's not really an issue, um, the ownership necessarily. Like, he is a he, he's a far higher upside arm than 35% ownership would suggest. So it's not that. It's the price tag, right, 12.8. And it's a little bit of the contact profile, right? Kind of susceptible sometimes to some walks, certainly to left-handers. Some hard contact, 37% there, and 080 ground balls per fly ball. We talked about this uh, a few times this season with Spencer Strider. He is attackable, and we just talked about it with Bryce Miller. We go after these numbers, right? Um, it's just that Strider has a 37% K rate against the left side of the plate, so it's far harder excuse me, to uh, go after Strider than it is like Bryce Miller with a 19% strikeout rate. So it's just pieces here from the Giants. He did really, in his last start, he just saw them, what, not seven days ago uh, in Atlanta, and he went seven innings, struck out 10, uh, put up a 38 spot or whatever. Um, so he's, he's very clearly got the upside again. This game is in San Francisco, it's 60 degrees, and even if he does give up a little bit of contact here, like the ballpark is going to play this way, way down. So... I got no problems playing Strider. Once again, it's just a price tag thing that you got to manage here in constructions. Uh, this is why the White Sox are popping so hard and some of the cheaper teams. It's because they allow you to get to Strider. But other teams like Oakland, for example, in short pieces, uh, Kansas City, etc., etc., you can make Strider teams happen 
the Rockies, right? If you want to do that, you could. There are plenty of other offenses here that are off the board, not nearly as popular as the White Sox. That can get you to Strider too. So no problems here. Uh, Logan Webb, I think he's also in play. 9200. I generally don't like this matchup, of course, against the Braves, right? Uh, we don't want to go after them, but he's also pitching in San Francisco tonight. 121 WRC plus 21 percent K rate. All the power in the world at 221. But Logan Webb here, well, his price tag's not north of 10.5 anymore like he was earlier in the season. He's 9,200 now. He's at uh, maybe not a seasonal price low, but it's pretty damn close. His price has been trending down uh, to the downside for quite some time now. Uh, we have seen him at 9,200 once before this season. Uh, we did see him earlier in the year, you know, in the mid-7Ks, uh, 8Ks even a little bit. That didn't last very long. Um, but the price tag is coming down again, and that puts us back into really excitable range, so to speak, with Logan Webb because he's got so many ground balls, and he still has above-average strikeout stuff, right? Still doesn't give up a lot of production or power. Give up some average, right, 270 batting average and a 160 ISO to the right-handers. But still, at 250 ground balls per fly ball, we can stomach a little bit of batting average sometimes because there's not a lot of over-the-wall power. He just doesn't give up homers, and he's still got a 3.5 ERA sitting right in line with his, his expected metric. So um, I got no problems going after a little bit of the Braves here. I don't want anything to do with their offense tonight, um, and that probably includes Ronald Acuna he would be the one I, I would play, but I don't want to play anybody else. You're probably going to get Ozzy Albies, or you could get Ozzy Albies back tonight. He's eligible at least to come off of the DL. They might not activate him because this is a bad matchup, and you know if he needs more time, they should probably just give it to him uh, because they're you know going to walk away with this freaking division. Um, I got no problem playing Logan Webb here tonight. At very low ownership, he still has 25-point upside, even in a very good, difficult matchup. Uh, there, there's just This is one of the few spots of the entire season where I'm going to say I'm totally off of Atlanta, every single one of them. Uh, I don't like the price tags. I'm not doing it in this particular matchup in this ballpark when it's 60 degrees. It's just not happening. Uh, if it burns me, it burns me. Sure, you want to play him in the late slate? Like, go ahead. But... Uh, I'm not doing this on the main slate, um, and I don't think anybody really should. They're, as a matter of fact, in terms of projections and and uh, top stack probability right now, based on our sheets value score metric, uh, they are second to last. Guess who's the last? Well, it's the other side of the game, and it's and it's San Francisco. So, um, no offense here for me. I don't want to deal with any of this. Just play pitching and play both sides in tournaments. Absolutely, get to some Logan Webb in cash. Just click in the Strider and don't think twice. Okay, that's it. We are done. Let's go over a review. St. Louis and Philly. I like offense mostly, um, or pretty much exclusively. I don't want to deal with the Michaelis. I don't think he's very good. Chris Sanchez, a little bit expensive for my taste in this matchup. Favor the Cardinals, but I think Philly stacks could be found as well. Kyle Schwarber's okay. 5,900 for Bryce Harper. Not so much, but I do really like Bryce and Stott. Kind of jumps at you here at second base. 4,300. He didn't strike out at all. So uh, really attractive. Um, maybe a little three-man there or something. You could play a Trey Turner uh, or a Castellanos or, you know, something like it. You could find something for Philly. Not my favorite. Colorado and Baltimore. Colorado is in play a little bit at very cheap price tags against Cole Irvin. You're going to get some leverage off of him. I think I'd probably rather decide with Cole Irvin, though, at 5 thousand I believe he was um did Colorado outside of Coors is absolutely atrocious and they're worse against left-handed pitching than pretty much every other team in baseball and give me all the Baltimore I can get against Kyle Freeland uh really really good spot for them I, I think even weather considered and matchup considered for the the Boston Dodgers game down here I think Baltimore is probably my favorite stack uh so a good bit of Cole Irvin and correlated teams, too. And most everybody from Baltimore I like. Cubs, Pittsburgh, probably no offense here for me. I, I respect Mitch Keller. I don't want to stack against him necessarily, even though he's got some vulnerabilities to the left side. Uh, it's hard to stack when he is very, very good against the right side. Same thing with Kyle Hendricks. Uh, I respect the changeup, and he's still a pretty respectable arm here anymore. I don't really want to play much of Pittsburgh over here. Maybe a Juwan Bay or Jackson Winsky or something like that. Um, McCutcheon, 42, and a little bit of a reverse split since you won't have to deal with the changeup all that much against Hendricks. I think that's okay. If you land on a Hendricks team, I, I'd probably argue with you, but probably not 
um, you know, all that hard. Cleveland, Toronto. Give me some Cleveland here, I think, a little bit. Uh, certainly in short stacks. I think they're easier to stack than, say, the Cubs, for example. Uh, maybe a little bit of Tanner Bybee. Maybe a little bit of Chris Bassett. I think both of these guys are playable, as I mentioned in the breakdown. Really interesting tournament game. I'm going to stay off of Toronto for the most part, I think. I really respect Tanner Bybee, and I think he's a pretty bad spot for their offense. Does that mean I want to click in a ton of Tanner Bybee? Well, probably not. It's still a hard spot. But uh, I think some Tanner Bybee short uh, correlations with, uh, you know, like three-man Cleveland stacks or something, I think those are in play uh, for lefties only against Chris Bassett because he's fantastic against the right side. Dodgers-Boston, got to worry about weather here. Uh, no pitching whatsoever for me. My favorite stack would be Boston in this game, uh, even though I love the Dodgers too. These are the top three stacks for me, Baltimore, Boston, and the Dodgers, of course. Probably in that order, I would think. But you got to manage, uh, you got to manage weather and some ownership too. They're going to be popular uh, for however popular a team can be on a 12-game slate. Angels, Mets, uh, no Patty Sandoval for me here tonight. I think I'm just worried about upside in this particular matchup. Maybe a short stack of the Mets, uh, like a two-three-four, three-four-five something, with. Uh, Lindor, Alonzo, and Frankie Alvarez. Uh, could I say, yeah, sure. Uh, okay, like, fine. Uh, the walk rate's been much better. He's only I can stomach walking two guys to start, even though I still hate it. Um, I think there's a lot of upside in this particular matchup for the Angels, or uh, getting the Angels uh, with a right-hander, who has a lot of swing and miss still. Um, I'll play some could I say, but I'm not happy about it. Uh, Oakland and the White Sox, a um, lot of ownership going to come to the White Sox here tonight. It's probably pretty warranted. They get Newcomb coming in and the opener here, Zach Neal. Dylan Cease, for sure, he's going to see a lot of ownership, too. If you want to come off of this a little bit, I don't think it's bad. My favorite's going to be Ryan Noda, uh, but go ahead, play Seth Brown. Yeah, that's fine at 3,500, dual eligible, but my favorite's definitely Ryan Noda. Um, but no problem playing a good bit of Dylan Cease as well and offensively yeah sure play the white Sox. my favorite is probably just short stacks because the white Sox are garbage um yeah okay fine yeah i'll play some of them but i'm not really happy about it they're hard to really get excited about texas minnesota i don't really want to stack texas here tonight i really respect sunny gray still but could he be in play yeah sure at nine thousand, I'd, I'd rather play hunter green i think but um you know, Sonny Gray is in play because he's, well, at this point in his career, a you know, far better arm than than, than uh, Hunter Green. Dane Dunning is also in play. This is a really good matchup for him, and he excels in bad ma or in good matchups against bad teams. Uh, Minnesota, I don't want any of the offense over here from them. Um, even my token, Eddie Julian, I, I just don't like going after Dane Dunning's cutter. It's just a fantastic pitch. I've got the same respect for that that I do for, uh, where is he, Kyle Hendricks' changeup. Um, so he's in play too at 7,400 if you want to get there. Uh, no offense really at all in that game. San Diego, Milwaukee, Darvish, and Brandon Woodruff mostly pitching here once again for me. Um, maybe a Yelich, Rowdy Telez type from the Brewers. No San Diego whatsoever for me. I'm just going to stay off. I like Brandon Woodruff a good bit. Uh, I think he is not getting the respect in the, in the markets here from an ownership perspective that he should be. Uh, this is a pretty good matchup for him, I think. Since he and Arizona, I like the Reds here tonight. Give me Hunter Green a little bit. Um, you can get a good bit of leverage, double the field if you only get 8%, 10%, whatever. Going after Arizona, I think this is a much better matchup for him than was Toronto in his last outing where he got destroyed. Uh, give me some righties over here if I'm going to play anybody against Hunter Green. And sure, you want to play Corbin Carroll? Yeah, go ahead. Ketel Marte, they're at playable price tags. You want to play a three-man, Carroll, Marte, Christian Walker? That's okay. I don't want to deal with anybody else, though. And Brandon Fott, yeah, I'm going to have some of him. But it's not going to be 20, 25% or whatever is suggested right now. That's way too high, I think, given his metrics. I want to play some Cincinnati. I think they're a really intriguing stack here tonight. Kansas City, Seattle, short pieces from the Royals here for me against Bryce Miller, mostly lefties, and maybe a Salvi here or there. Um, Bryce Miller, yeah, maybe a little bit too because the Royals are still a pretty poor creation offense in aggregate. He's really damn good against the right side. Um, no offense really here for Seattle for me. I like Brady Singer a little bit, 6,900. Um, not really scared of Julio necessarily here tonight. Brady Singer induces a lot of ground balls, and that's a bad bite of ball matchup for Julio. It would be like Cal Raleigh from the left side or something like that um, who'd be the favorite, but that's pretty much it. Mostly Brady Singer and um, 
you know, little Royals pieces, I guess. And only pitching here for me, Spencer Strider, and Logan Webb, though. I wouldn't leave him off in tournaments. I think he's got a little bit of upside in this particular spot. Uh, so that's it. We're done here. Keep an eye out for ownership and projections pushes as always, as we'll be pushing them all throughout the day. And good luck to everybody here on this Friday 12 Gamer.